Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our session, the Holly, Hollywoodization of, of podcasts. Uh, my name is Wesley Livesey, and since 2014, I've done a weekly history podcast, first on the First World War and now on the Second World War. Um, it is a solo podcast where I do 25-ish minute episodes every week. And when I think of how podcasting has changed in the last decade, there's like a million different avenues of discussion that we could go down. But when I specifically think of Hollywoodization, kind of the two things that I think are most impactful is just the general popularity growth of podcasts, and then the absolutely tremendous amount of money that has been floating around the podcast space over the last few years. Um, both of these kind of trends have created kind of a flow of resources in and out of podcasting with ideas flowing out of podcasts and into other media like television shows, and also like a tremendous amount of money and, you know, traditional Hollywood flowing into podcasting, money, advertising, celebrity podcasts, all of those are coming into podcasts. The, the wider popularity of podcasts was probably the first thing to shift. You know, anybody who's been making or listening to podcasts for a long time knows that there was a point not that long ago where if you mentioned podcast, it was like a coin flip on whether or not you were going to have to explain what a podcast was because people just did not know. Uh, but then over the last five years, you know, listener numbers for podcasts have skyrocketed. Um, numbers are, are always a little fuzzy, but marketing studies have numbers of around 400 million worldwide podcast listeners in 2022, and that's estimated to reach 500 million by 2024. That's tremendous growth, and you know it will continue to accelerate, in my opinion, as a larger number of non-English language podcasts continue to be launched, uh, kind of tapping into the much larger number of people around the world that don't speak English. With so many podcast listeners, a few years ago, podcasts started being adopted into other more expensive to produce mediums like television shows and sometimes movies based on fiction podcasts, which we discussed here in a little bit. A media production companies kind of seized upon this as a way to take proven intellectual property with a proven audience and turn those into something that's more expensive because podcasts are, of course, very cheap to make in terms of time and money. The possibility of kind of cashing out through a production deal has brought more money into podcasting as individuals and companies make their own run at getting lucky to varying degrees of success. But along with that path to financial success, there were also an, there's also been an increased attempt to make money directly from listeners within the podcast space specifically. As with many things in society, kind of, I don't know, money followed the people <laughs> into podcasting. Uh, statistics from the Interactive Advertising Bureau have total podcast ad revenue at around 105 million in 2015 and almost 1.5 billion in 2021. And they estimate that it'll be 4 billion by 2024. Um, some companies have taken these numbers and it is, have made the, their goal to make money from podcasts, putting real money behind marketing and production. And then other companies have come in to make things that will help other people make money where they can, you know, take a cut off the top. These developments, I feel, have, have been great for creators and listeners in some ways, at least. You know, it's never been easier to make a podcast on the technical side with dedicated apps and hosting and sort of the widespread availability of decent microphones um, or even to make a little money off your podcast, you know, inserting dynamic ads never been easier. And the path to being pro as a podcaster is probably as good as it has ever been, which is maybe a low bar, but, and, and listeners also like listeners of podcasts, you know, can have higher expectations for production values with, I think the biggest difference being the floor of audio quality now compared to like five to seven years ago being totally different. Um, people also have a wider, more diverse set of choices in podcasts, both in terms of content and the creators themselves. But I think there's also been some downsides with these developments. It's never been more difficult for a podcast to be noticed and discovered. It's no longer just about making something good and being able to climb up the charts and, and gather up listeners because you're contending with literally million dollar marketing budgets. Um, there have been also these, you know, somewhat more recent rise of celebrity podcasts where it seems like every week a celebrity starts a podcast to talk about, I don't know, stuff I've tried. I've tried to listen to them, not a fan, but I know they have their, <laughs> I know they have their fans, but I think the question still remains of whether or not 
these developments are good or bad for educational podcasts, like I know many here make, or just independent podcasts of any kind in general. And I have to admit that when I sat down to organize my thoughts on this conference and on this session, I came in with a very negative viewpoint. <laughs> um, but having thought about it quite a bit more over the last week, I think I'm probably less sure of that negativity. I think that there are some negative aspects to how podcasts have changed uh, around this, you know, Hollywoodization and around the money that's flowing in and out. You know, it's making it more challenging for listeners to discover some creators' work, and it's raising the expectations of a lot of listeners around what they expect from from their podcasts. But there's also some really good aspects. You know, there's a lot of money flooding in. Um, which has made it easier for anybody to create and distribute a podcast. There's never been more people listening. And with more people come the greater possibility that any podcast, no matter how niche, can still find their own listener base. So I think I went from being very negative to being very, I don't really know, which maybe isn't the best way to end my my piece of, of this session. But um, yeah, I think it's a, there's been a lot of interesting things. And Hannah is now going to tell us about some more interesting things. Yeah, Wesley, thank you. Um, and I really appreciate your thoughts. And I uh, I think the sort of question you ended on is one that we will be discussing further. Um, so maybe a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a second year PhD researcher and I'm, fiction I'm focusing on paranoia in fictional podcasts, American fictional podcasts, mostly in the last decade. Um, and I'm currently working on a chapter on Homecoming, uh, the podcast, and also how it has been translated into television series starring Julia Roberts. Um, and I'm, I was, I've been thinking a lot about basically the podcast to, I guess, Hollywood uh, trajectory. And um, one of the things that I was wondering is maybe um, whether Hollywoodization is the best title for this uh, platform or for this um for this roundtable or this discussion today because to me it also seems to be a more of a netflix vacation because i feel like you see a lot of um podcasts that are turned into television series and homecoming is one example of that but you also have uh archive 81 um there's lore you also have uh only murders in the building which is uh i think i would argue that's the fictionalization of basically serial uh the main character there um her name is, or like uh, the sort of main podcaster figure uh, looks exactly like Sarah Koenig and her name is Cindy Canning, which I think is kind of interesting how it sort of sounds similar to Sarah Koenig. So I think there's some, well, so one thing that I would argue is that what I find very interesting is that this sort of um, Hollywoodization or Netflixification of podcasts um, also shows the creativity of podcasts and that they have been reaching larger and larger audiences. So I think um, there's the sort of, um, creative momentum mostly coming from fictional podcasts and then they get translated into like a uh, television series with like differing success because Archive 81 is supposed to be like a big success but then it was also cancelled after one season and so I'm not sure what that means exactly and one of the things that I've been trying to grapple with recently is what happens when a fictional podcast uh, gets turned, turned into a television series or something uh, from an audio or from a medium that's so distinctly focused on audio what if that gets translated into a visual medium and i i found personally listening to the first episode knowing homecoming closely and then watching the first television episode which was basically all the dialogue was the same but then with image i was just i, I felt myself wondering like, what is the what is the value of uh turning this into a television series and so on the one hand i think it's really interesting how a lot of sort of the narrative production seems to come or a lot or at least some of it seems to come from podcasting which i think also shows the sort of initial excitement and creativity but then on the other hand um yeah like what is what happens in this translation mode and i, I think also some of the value of the podcast and as a medium gets lost um i think and um i think i also share some of the concerns that wesley noted about sort of how that this increasing flow of money also change leads lists to some kind of different in difference in how people perceive podcasts uh, as something that needs to make money that needs to address a particular audience as opposed to something that started out as just sort of this fun project that friends could do and I feel like we're podcasts used to be for me uh, this sort of great site of uh, experimentation and I feel like they're now also really formalizing and they're really turning into maybe less of a uh, one a, like a single narrator and the how to experiment with how to tell stories and sound towards more of a 
almost very produced cinema like uh, yeah like a podcast with with just a kind of uh with like how it's musically produced and how it's really producing this kind of surround sound that sometimes can also be very destructive um and so i think i'll leave it at that and uh i'll hand the floor over to dario thanks hannah um yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. And uh, I'm going to sort of develop on, obviously, some of the ideas that Wesley and Hannah have already talked about. Um, so I host a podcast called The Cinematologist, which we, has been going since 2015, which is based on my background as a, a film academic. But um, as my experience with podcasting as um, a practice and as a medium for creating and communicating research and knowledge, if I can be that grand. As that has developed, I've shifted more towards focusing on the academic study of podcasting. So I've written a range of articles which kind of come out of a media communication studies, maybe even philo philosophical approach. And I also host and produce a podcast with Laurie Bexett called the Podcast Studies Podcast. Um, and I recently published an article called A Cinema for the Years, Imagining the Audio Cinematic Through Podcasting, a nice big pretentious title there, um, which context this contextualizes film podcasts and how they potentially utilize aspects of the cinematic experience. So that links a little bit to what Hannah's just said there. Um, the question of whether Holly Hollywoodization is good or bad for podcasting, I suppose, depends on context and what we mean by Hollywoodization. Now, like Hannah, I would also question Hollywoodization is even a valid term to apply to podcasts. So I'm doing that cliched thing of questioning the very premise of the panel. Sorry about that, but uh, I think it's warranted. Um, but I'm gonna try and broaden out how we might think of Hollywoodization. And I'll do that by quickly framing some strands of analysis that apply the concept of Hollywoodization to film and then say whether or not, or potentially whether there are some parallels in podcasting. So as mentioned, the notion of adaptation of podcasts to become films or television seem to be the most apparent use of the term at this point. But actually, does this actually really mean that there is a podcastification of Hollywood? So the direction of influence, we have to think about that. Is it going one way or the other, or is it cyclical? And I'll come back to that. But in a more traditional vein, how might we think about the notion of Hollywoodization? Well, we could start by thinking about it with regards to the vertical in integration model associated with Hollywood's early golden age. So big studios controlling top down the production consumption and distribution of films. Now, corporate culture has long since um, taken over from the original studio. So films are much more part of a transmedia land landscape of multi-platform content. And now we have the tech conglomerates, of course, that organize content across many different networks of delivery systems. And John Sullivan's work on formalization and platformization looks in detail at this from a podcasting um, perspective, but just a kind of summary of, of what we might think about in that, in that regard. So if you think about podcast infrastructure, we may look at the ways in which the institutions, particularly in the last few years, have begun to control talents, trying to tie it to branded podcast production and place it within gate-kept venues of consumption. So you could argue there are parallels to be drawn with the Hollywood model as it was back in the golden age. Um, and of course, this goes against the open model of, of open source RSS, which is basically the battle for the identity of podcasting, which is still going on. Um, but interestingly, then, you could argue that podcasts could be considered structurally more like Hollywood than Hollywood actually is itself these days. Um, another possible look at Hollywoodization is in terms of the star system. So films, as, as has been already mentioned, films are built on or created and around the managed persona of certain stars. Um, as podcasts have become more mainstream, one of the methods of delivering a guaranteed audience is to build a show around a star persona. And, and this arguably reverses um, some of the ways that, that we might understand the, the early roots of podcasting, you know, this sort of cult independent status before 2012 and few uh, you know you could argue that the few stars drew audiences over to podcasting before that period you know even early adopters say like someone like Ricky Gervais who was in the podcasting sphere very early on it's not as if he brought a massive audience over to podcasting um and again that's an anecdotal statement you know what I mean <laughs> I'd have to look at the figures on that to be absolutely sure but it's that's what it seems to me um but there are stars of podcasting in their own right of course 
that have emerged from the unique infrastructure of podcast creation and distribution, which arguably exploded, you know, post 2014, 2015. So we might think about people like Ira Glass, Sarah Koenig, who's already been mentioned, Caitlin Press, Mark Maron, and Big Claxon, Joe Rogan. Um, interestingly, stars of Hollywood are also adopting podcasting, but not necessarily to talk about films. So people like Dakota Johnson, Richard E. Grant, Kate, Kate Hudson have all got podcasts where they're not necessarily talking about film, but stars of Hollywood also do have podcasts where they do talk about film. So Jason Bateman, Lena Dunham, Anna Faris, Alec Baldwin and Kevin Pollock are all examples of that. Um, but there are a lot of big names who don't podcast and the biggest of the big names in Hollywood, you know, I don't think any of them have a podcast. But yet there are stars who bring a massive name to the podcast space and it's a simple way for them to um, keep themselves relevant and be and, and develop their brand. So people like Michelle Obama, Meghan Markle, Dua Lipa, these kinds of people you could argue are stars, but they're not podcast stars and they're not movie stars either, but they are stars in the podcast space. Um, now, like, uh, like Wesley talked about, as a small independent podcaster, the star-based chat cast seems to me to be increasingly inane. Although, you know, you could argue that actually what, Chatcast podcast did particularly with stars is um, allow us to move on from the really inane press junket culture that's around that surrounds Hollywood promotion. So I think that was a good aspect of the way that podcasts, when stars, when movie stars go onto podcasts now, I think there's increasingly a sense that they have to they have to kind of present something more than just PR for their movie. And another definition of Hollywoodization relates very much to the effect of cultural imperialism. Of Hollywood and its effect on global audiences. So the impact of consumption patterns, i.e. the weight of content driven by the flooding of American products has been a key focus throughout the history of cinema. And you can look at this from an industry angle, but also from an ideological worldview. So do we have something similar in podcasting where, you know, English, are English language podcasts seen as dom dominant? Do they assert a Western worldview? Um, does the combination of tech infrastructures, do, do, does that manifest cultural influences, which basically ideologically interpolate listeners to hear the world through an Ameri American sonic filter? Well, I, I think it's difficult to argue that there is the language differentiation, the fracturing of audiences and niche production of the majority of podcasts means that um, it doesn't apply that model, that top down model of broadcast few to many doesn't apply in the same way. And like Hannah was talking about, I think, and, and Wesley as well, we have to be very careful of, about making sure what we're talking about here. Is Hollywoodization the same as Americanization or commercialization or net, Netflixification? All of these things are slightly, slightly different. Um, I think I'm just going to skip on a little bit. I want to draw this to a, to a close. I would argue that if, um, if podcasting is driven both in how it's driven both technologically and in terms of the aesthetics, I think historically you'd have to argue it's much more, my, if we're talking about it in terms of an American context, it's much more a combination of NPR, talk radio and American stand-up than Hollywood. But you could argue that, that that is changing now. And I think that there are interesting possibilities that are much more beyond just Hollywood using podcasts as a kind of cheap option to be able to expand its possibilities, like a pilot version of a show that it will then create. I mean, if you look at, um, in a Hollywood context, if you look at the film, um, Don't Look Up, that was accompanied by a really interesting podcast called The Last Movie Ever Made. And it was kind of followed the drama of the making of the film, which happened in lockdown, and also mirrored the themes of kind of apocalypse that came along when, if you remember, when the first, sort of first six months of, of, of the COVID uh, period, which was, you know, we haul out with a sort of really big sense of uh, anxiety there. Um, and I'm currently working something on something on a much smaller scale where I'm working with an independent production company and director to create a podcast that lies somewhere between the behind the scenes production recording that could be part of marketing and PR and the story of a film being made as a drama in its own right. So just to conclude then with, with Hollywood, as the engine of film production in the US much more fractured than it once was and the barriers breaking down between film television games and podcasting in a way that means they can no longer be seen as medium specific I think it's one dimensional to see podcasting as become becoming Hollywoodized in a top-down sense so to say podcasting is Hollywoodized 
and to argue whether it's good or bad, one has to acknowledge the layers of context that have to be understood before you actually um, suggest that in, in the context of today's complex media landscape. Thanks. So I think we're, we're happy to take any questions or anybody uh, wants to comment on anything that's... Uh... Questions on anything we've said and uh, the very concept of this panel, it sounds like. We're, we're open. <laughs> we've opened the entire can of worms. Um, I'll uh, go first while, while other people think of think yeah. of questions. Uh, Hannah, I had a question for you. You mentioned that you had listened to Homecoming. <clears throat> the the podcast homecoming and then you you started watching the adaptation and you know you watched it um do you think like the the markets are the same for podcasts versus adaptations um I, i've been thinking about this topic a lot because of the black hole that i've fallen into of the new lord of the rings rings of power show on amazon and people having thoughts about how they've adapted that material do, do you think the 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 podcast market and the adaptation market are kind of targeting the same group of individuals? Yeah, I think that's a question I'm sort of trying to figure out because I've uh, mostly now spoken to people who have uh, only seen the, the television series and they so and they said only and I feel like the the television series are usually people often don't even realize that it's made from a podcast um, or that it was based on a podcast. So I, I mean, yeah, I guess. A sort of me uh, a total podcast nut and I'm really interested in, in podcasts I feel like I'm usually very critical of these television adaptations because I was very excited about sort of the media specificity and sort of this experimentation of how can you make a story and sound um, and sound only and like what does it mean to have a fictional podcast um, so I feel like the, definitely the podcasting seems to be much more niche still um, at the same time, one thing that I also, that I'm curious about and what I feel like that's also playing a big role that I haven't really addressed yet is like what the kinds of companies and what their aims are with making a particular series. So Gimlet, so Homecomings, the podcast and also the television series, they were also very much involved in that. Um, but that's like a, uh, a podcast company that had as a, as a sort of express purpose to make a profitable company. And so uh, you can also, they have Startup, which is a podcast about how they started their podcast company. They, they're really good at making everything into content, which is very helpful if you're researching them. Um, but so they start off by saying, okay, we have this idea of starting a podcast company. And instead of like starting with the podcast, they actually start with how to find a company, com uh, like how to find a company and how to make it profitable and how to make sure that we have a uh, venture capitalist investing into into these projects so it was best it was like very much its express purpose was to make something that's profitable and so i think that also creates a particular kind of audience for uh the kind of content that they're trying to make so with the homecoming podcast they had uh catherine keener david schrimmer they had like a pretty star uh yeah they're like huge names on the cast itself so i feel like they were already like trying to use these movie uh like people that are famous from movies and from hollywood to basically yeah like make sure that people are listening to their podcast but then they were also so excited about the uh taking it to hollywood and having you know julia roberts and sam Esmail attached to the television series so they seem to have this express purpose of making money whereas i think if you look at some other uh fictional podcasts like welcome to night Vale, there seems to be like a very niche audience uh also usually like young like higher educated uh, also queer youth that seem to be very much attracted to that because i've been on uh i've been to some live shows and i've interviewed some people uh, that are listening to it so i feel like that's definitely their their purpose is also very different so i think and i feel like the latter the sort of welcome to nightfall example is something that we may lose in this hollywoodification or netflixification of podcasting this sort of group of friends or or people from theater makers that come together and make a podcast like very cheap uh, and very interested in the medium itself rather than like a profitable Hollywood like podcast or film or television series basically so I, I think that was something that I would like to add to that yeah there's a, there's a hand up in the chat Jill hey can everyone hear me yes, yes. oh good I apologize for not having my camera on. I am visiting family and it's difficult to find a space to be, <laughs> but I'm in a relatively quiet space. So 
Um, I asked a question in the chat about parasocial relationships, but I also now actually have a different um, question kind of coming off of what Hannah said. And that's this idea that I've often viewed podcasting as kind of a way to have marginalized voices kind of have a space. And so I think I was a little bit more like Wesley, a little bit cynical about the, <laughs> the idea of the Hollywoodization um, or commercialization maybe of podcasts as because in the past, things that have been kind of grassroots and, and niche and then become kind of commercialized can squeeze out um, people, marginalized groups and, and people who don't have big budgets and stuff like that. And so I see that there is opportunity here, but I wonder what your thoughts are about kind of some, of, some more thoughts on those kind of risks. Do you want to have a go at that, Wesley, or do you want me to, or Hannah? You can. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the whenever you talk about any kind of medium that that you align with a kind of formulaic way, you know, mode of production, then there are always going to be, you know, possibilities of exclusion, you know, regarding identities and, you know, represented groups. I think... The, the the sort of sense of money being thrown at, at, at podcasting. Um, again, it's difficult for me to comment about what where, where that money goes and who gets to make the decisions. Because so there's this like so there's a structural element to this, and then there is a representation of what would be in film in front of the camera or behind the microphone element of it. So say for example, if all of the all of the um, people who have the power to green light something are white men, for example, because they hold all of the money, is it probably, if they green light everything that, that is hosted and produced by women of color, let's say, is there structural inequality still? Yes. Is the outcome possibly, you know, um, going to be actually a positive one because we're seeing and hearing more voices from different represented group groups? Yes. So it's very, it's, you know, there's a, there's a sort of complicated you know, relationship in terms of the structure of the industry and then what we what we hear rather than what we see on, on film. I mean, you know, again, at, at the risk of being controver controversial, I think that the, the, the money of, you know, when I've tried to apply for stuff, you know, the, the, the kind of things that I'm interested in kind of talking about and what have you in, in terms of podcasting is not de jour, let's say. Uh, let's put it that way. And I think there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of money out there to um, produce shows that will have, you know, different experiences and different voices. And that's quite right. You know, that's the the, the, the industry and everything is changing in, in that way. And lots of different industries are, are, are changing, whether that there's a kind of tokenism element to that. Again, that's always something you've got to kind of fight against. Um, but again, I think I'm not somebody I don't think who can answer that question, not being within industry in, in terms of the way that people think um, about that. So I always, I'm, I'm just viewing that kind of from the outside as maybe people are here. I think one of the challenges around having like diverse voices and, and creators is is one of discoverability, kind of the the tech problem that I feel like a lot of those those creators and those voices have had for many years now around um, you know, it's easy to to make the content, but how do people actually find out about it? Like, how how can you make sure that the people who may benefit or you know want to hear your voice know that it exists in a landscape where there's these much larger podcasts that are monopolizing a lot of the the top charts and a lot of the ad spend and things like that. So um, I don't know how you fix that, <laughs> and you know, I guess part of that is is on the tech platforms themselves. To, to help with. And I, I don't think podcast discovery right now is in a good spot, which is just my opinion, but um, yeah. Yeah. I think I was also wondering about like, if things become, like if pro production values become really, really important and they are increasingly becoming important, it also seems to work a little bit against some of the feminist praxis that I really like in podcasting that, you know, like, if there is a baby crying in the next room, like that's your life and that's the way <laughs> things are. Um, and so, yeah, there, there is a way in which I wonder if it's, it loses some of the gritty authenticity that I sometimes like about indie podcasts, <laughs> but maybe there's room for all of it. So I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud kind of here. I, I think I've experienced that as well. You know, I've, 
I've had to, I feel pressure to change my recording schedule based on when my children are running around the house and making noise um, because of that sort of production pressure, production quality pressure that, that sometimes comes along with that. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, I think that is very real and, and as production quality demands from the listenership kind of continue to increase based on what can be found elsewhere, I think it is a, is a problem. I think I, if I if I may add to that, I like I also I completely agree with uh, everything that's been said before. And but I think there's sort of two things that play at the same time. I think on the one hand, there's like the easiness to produce a podcast, and I think that that's still really exciting, and that that really still allows for uh, potentially like marginalized or oppressed voices to be heard and to create podcasts. So it is really easy to it is, it's a lot easier to create a podcast than to create a movie or a television series, or if you talk about Hollywood vacation. But then, uh, so I think that there is definitely this sort of power in there and that podcasts have that and that that's still very exciting. And I still feel like that there's a lot of podcasts out there reaching audiences that uh, probably wouldn't, maybe through Twitter or like these, these sort of extended online cir circles that these podcast audiences move on, which I think very much has to do with our current environment. And then on the other hand, you have the sort of solidification um, of like the podcast platforms, uh, the the coming up of like uh, exclusive podcasts that are um, sort of the the, pay, the paying system. You have the Patreon system, which I think is like pretty exciting in its sort of grassrootness. At the same time, I'm paying a lot right now for podcasts where I felt at first I could listen to everything, but now I really have to subscribe to a particular podcast to listen to it. Um, but yeah, like the the sort of professionalization of the podcast sphere and the role of these um, big companies and tech companies algorithms. Uh, they seem to like clearly favor more professionally produced podcasts, but I, I still don't think that, I think both are at play at the same time. And I, yeah, I would, I wouldn't, I think that's why I'm also somewhat ambiguous about it. Cause I think it's great that there's more interest in podcasting, but then on the other hand, yeah, it's also a particular kind of podcast because I'm, I'm glad that people now know what a podcast is because I've been studying it for a while and I'm making one, but then at the same time, all the people listen to are the celebrity podcast and Joe Rogan. So it's kind of like, well, you know, you know what a podcast is, but do you really know what I think of? Because it, we're, we still seem to be on different levels. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to add that uh, to the conversation. Thank um, you. I was, I was going to read the question from Chad. Oh, sorry. Here. Go ahead. Go, go, yeah. go, go ahead. Um, Elena, I'm going to make a guess there. Hopefully I'm close on that. Um, has a question about podcasts being video recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Uh, assuming, you know, consumers are strictly watching these podcasts, does the way we consume the podcast make them any less than what they have historically been? Um, taking a podcast course and the constant, there's a constant discussion about the disruption of what a podcast is once something visual becomes available. Some of it, some argue that it takes the focus away from actually listening. I would agree with that. I think as soon as you place a visual element on the podcast beyond people talking into a microphone, you've crossed over into something else. Um, I, I do think, I, I do agree that there is a trend of things being put up on YouTube and it's, I don't know, I'm kind of fascinated by the idea that you can find listeners for a podcast by putting it on YouTube, even though I've done it. I've put my episodes on YouTube with nothing but like an image background with like information about the episode and I get listeners that way. And people ask me when I'm going to post the next episode because it's kind of a pain. So I, I don't do it every week. Um, so I don't know. It's it's interesting. It, but, but yeah, I, I do think once you add a video element, it is no longer a podcast and it is something else. Um, I'm kind of a little bit in two minds on that um, myself. I, I mean, I don't, with my stuff, I don't automatically or, or use... YouTube beyond the fact that my podcast hosting site actually spits one out to YouTube by, by itself. So you kind of just, and I don't check the numbers and stuff like that, but I, I, I can't remember the stat that I last read that talked about how many people actually listen to podcasts through YouTube, you know, whether it's just with a one image that never moves, but it's quite high actually. And I think there are people within podcasting who, again, maybe this is a, a, like, again, a sort of two schools of thought where they consider the podcast just to be a part of the, the stream of content. So, you know, they will literally post the YouTube video, but then also post an entire transcript 
of what they've said as the show notes of, of, of their podcast. So it's kind of like the, that attitude is the content is the, the thing that you want to get over is the important thing. Whether someone listens to it, reads it, or watches it on YouTube does not matter whatsoever. So I think there's a the different schools of thought on, on, on that, I guess. Yeah, this is super, oh, sorry. Milan's raising his hand and I'm not, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is so, so fascinating. You, you respond. <laughs> because yeah, I agree with Wesley. If the, if it, especially if it starts out as a video recorded thing, that's not a podcast. But like Dario just said, it, you can have a podcast version of the content and that's super common. And I, I'm just wondering like how useful is it to, distinguish all of these things i think as like scholars and stuff we would find it useful but to most people like on a day-to-day -day level it's maybe not useful and who cares what we call it it's content quote unquote uh, i love thinking about this so thank you all I, that's not i don't know if i had a question in there <laughs> i think I continue discussing no, because I, I found that super interesting and I was, I've been thinking about this too, but I, I think you cannot, it's very hard to talk about podcasts without talking about the larger media environment that, that they are in. And especially because a lot of the podcasts also, they, they generate more content than just the podcast itself. And I, I know, for example, some of the cases that I've been working with, they also make novels. Uh, but at the same time, the podcasts are also embedded in this sort of digital space. So um Serial has these show notes online where you can basically asking listeners to follow along and they often have a, a Twitter. So I think the podcast is already like heavily embedded in a larger media ecos ecosystem. So if you then think about YouTube as just another way to produce this outlet, like, yeah, is it then still originally a podcast? I think, or is it also just a podcast when people call it a podcast? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it doesn't really answer these questions and I think it raises more questions maybe. But I do think that it is necessary to see them in the larger media environment that they're in. You can, I think, because if a podcast is only audio, I think that also doesn't make sense because there's obviously also the very digital interface of of the, the telephone. Uh, I think I use like four <laughs> podcast apps at the same time because like some of the, some of the podcasts I listen to are on Stitcher uh, and then some of them are only on Spotify, which I hate by the way, because I want to listen to only music on Spotify, but then there's Spotify exclusives. But so I have to sh just switching or flicking through these apps kind of, I mean, I guess it's similar to, to television today, but I think that also made me realize like how different the interfaces are and how different I engage with them uh, because sometimes it's just really searching. Sometimes it's, some interfaces are smoother so I can sort of see and just click on whatever episode comes up and like, uh, yeah, I think there are that sort of the, the connections between that and uh, yeah, sort of branching out, extending. I think the, the sort of television series that I'm looking into are to me also an extension of a podcast, but are, yeah, are they really, I don't know. I mean, they're obviously television series, so there's something else, but yeah, I don't know how to, maybe someone else has more to say about adaptations, but I think it's a curious thing. Dario has now introduced two definitional conversations into the panel. We'll see if we can get a third in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> um, Milan. Well, I, I actually, I want to invite Mark just to speak on this a bit because we talked yesterday in the gather about um, his podcast and the relationship between YouTube and podcasts. So um, yeah, Mark, if you want to speak now, feel free. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was um, just going to say that um, there are presumably a lot of people who listen uh, to podcasts audio only on YouTube. Um, uh, because uh, YouTube Music works like any other audio streaming platform, like Spotify or whatever. So you can just listen um, uh, and, you know, ignore any images if there are any, or, uh, you know, there are also a lot of podcasts on YouTube uh, with without any image uh, or with just a static image. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of the audience for that. People who already... Um, pay for uh, YouTube premium, get to, to use I, um, uh, YouTube uh, music that way. So um, uh, I would imagine that's probably the biggest chunk of podcast listeners on, on YouTube. But there certainly are, you know, I think in a lot of ways, it, especially for big kind of network productions, um, uh, 
it's not that hard to slap on, uh, you know, a, just a, a video of people recording into a microphone. Um, and, and so a lot of them do it anyways, uh, whether or not people watch it or listen to it. Um, and I do know of a number of podcasts um, on YouTube that will put not really extensive image and imagery, um, and it, it can be optional. Um, so you can have just still images that refer to things that you've mentioned uh, in, you know, in the podcast, but they're not, they're, they're sort of tangential or they're, or they're, they're optional um, components of the podcast. So, I mean, it, yeah, it is a little bit of a hybrid between uh, podcasting and, uh, and YouTube proper, um, but it's, you know, it's not fully made like YouTube videos. Um, so it, it is a little bit of a, uh, kind of hybrid um, kind of space there. Interesting. And that really speaks to kind of the diverse way that people listen to podcasts and experience podcasts. Like I know mm -hmm. for me, like I would never go to a website and click on like the embedded player for a podcast, but I know that I, I have them on my websites. And I know one time when I broke it because I switched hosts and forgot to update the code, um, I had people email me and be like, hey, it's been like two months since you've released an episode. Are you going to release another episode? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, let, let me fix that. And like, that's just not how I personally experience podcasts. But that doesn't mean, you know, other people may, may not be doing something totally different to listen. At the same time, I have also sometimes seen the reverse happen because I was at a, uh, a panel uh, in a conference lately and someone was talking about YouTubers and they were talking about uh, Chapo Trap House, which is a podcast, uh, as if they were YouTubers or like YouTube personalities. And so they were, they were doing some kind of analysis of their appearances. And I was just like, well, but, you know, obviously there is just because I, th I think it's only an image and a podcast. So for me, it's just like these guys they're like they come from a podcast but then they're sort of I mean they're they're like performing live and stuff but I think to sort of try to analyze the aesthetics of how they look like doesn't make sense as, as a YouTube person that like didn't make sense to me because to me they were like really clearly uh podcasters so I think that's I think whatever discipline you're in you might be inclined to see things a particular way or, or but I was just sort of struck by it I was just like well are they YouTube personalities or are they just you know a bunch of guys that are making a podcast to me like it seemed to be the, the latter but yeah anyway i have uh, it's jill again hi <laughs> i have one podcast that i follow and they had a youtube video that they they didn't upload the podcast to the youtube video they'd upload like supplemental stuff or just so it was always these little short videos whereas the podcast was like an hour um, and then they found that the YouTube channel started getting a whole lot more traction and there was like some pressure to try and make the channel something more. And they kept going on the channel and being like, we're podcasters, we're podcasters, like go to our website and listen to our podcast. The channel is supplementary, but it's curious, right? Cause it goes back to the medium, like the channel started taking over and they started feeling pressure. I know one of them, she's a friend of mine and we talked about it and they started feeling pressure to like not be podcast. Like, it felt inauthentic, she said, like they were being pressured by the medium to not be podcasters anymore because the channel was more successful than the podcast. I, uh, uh, yeah, an, go ahead, I'll let you go first. Sorry, no, just, I was just gonna say, it's, it, uh, I think in some of, some of these panels that there has been this um, theme that, that, that crosses over a little bit to what we're talking about now in terms of um, if, if you're a, a particularly a, a certain type of podcast that you would call either an independent or academic podcaster and there's all there's a sort of question in your mind always about what am I why am I doing this you know what I mean that that because the, the, the aim I mean in, in our wildest imaginations we might think to ourselves oh the podcast that I produce is gonna blow up and become something where I have to kind of manage it as this big entity you know and I think that 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 is less and less likely as the the moneyed production interests have come to dominate what can become successful, and that's probably the the, the biggest element of Hollywoodization, where there's a machine around something that can be that can get to the point where it's being listened to by millions and millions of people. And the equivalent is, you know, you look at the way that. Hollywood movies are marketed now. There is $250 million temple movies 
which everybody will go and see, then there is a massive gap, which has been filled by television and streaming at home. And then there are micro budget indie movies, which is kind of sim similar, I think, in a way to the way that podcasting has has gone. And it's interesting then when you're at the you're at the bottom end of that, you almost have to be satisfied with that kind of small niche audience that maybe your whoever is able to cultivate and what the maximum ceiling of of what you can produce actually is and it's the same as indie filmmakers now they can make this amazing movie but nobody's really ever going to see it because it's not going to get a release it may get something on on stream sorry um I, I think that your your example though does speak to kind of listener expectations and those expectations do go beyond just like sound quality which is something that i mentioned in my se section like there's all kinds of other expectations that come along with that uh to uh to advertise the backlog of history podcast symposiums last year whose videos are up on youtube i talked a little bit about sort of listener expectations and and how those can influence the podcaster and so i think that you know people then expecting that that group to suddenly be making a bunch of YouTube videos when they don't have the time to do that is one of those expectations. And there's other expectations that come with very high quality podcasts coming out twice a week that talk about all this different stuff. It's like, okay, well, why are you only releasing every month or, or whatever? Or why is Jill's podcast not released an episode since June 14th, Jill? I'm, I, I'm a listener. <laughs> I'm waiting. Um, <laughs> I think, but there's all kinds of stuff like that. And I think that um, it it has a particular impact on, you know, people who are just squeezing their podcast in, in their free time in a way that makes it very challenging to, to meet some, some people's expectations of what a podcast could be and what they want it to be um, that, that can be challenging. Well, yeah, this, this conversation, I didn't want to interrupt it earlier, but it's actually come around to the thing I've been wanting to ask for a while, which is um, kind of about production values and the new technologies that are becoming more affordable and accessible, um, which had been mentioned already. Um, one thing that I have been thinking about during this conversation is um, the that there's potentially a sort of parallel here with um, kind of video games and like indie video games. Um, I just posted a link, which is by um, a blog post by Robert Yang, who is a scholar and maker of video games. Um, this isn't actually the perfect piece, but I couldn't find the, the right one right now. But his argument is basically like the sort of um, extremely like photorealistic um, uh, visual uh, technologies that, that the video game industry has started to really throw tons and tons of money at. Um, those technologies are now becoming available to indie game makers and that actually um, they should be using those technologies as a way of sort of, um, you know, stealing some of that kind of prestige and, um, you know, expensiveness that the, the like highly, um, Kind of commercialized video game industry has has had a monopoly on um and so i just i i also wanted to post a link to uh the work of someone who again i met yesterday and was very curious to hear about um maybe she'll be around today as well but um so dana little is using um this relatively new podcast service called descript um i don't know if other people have used this already um, one of the things that Descript can do is you feed it enough of your own voice and it will create a synthesized voice that then you can like type out words and it will have um, like Descript will then generate your voice saying those words aloud and you can even give it different moods. So, you know, you can give it like, you know, excited or angry or bored and it will, you know, you simply type in the words and it will speak them back to you in your own voice with a certain kind of affect. And so Dana is, I mean, Descript designs it as a way of kind of making podcasts, um, making podcast creation more efficient, right? That you don't have to like go back and re-record something if you just want to change a few words. But Dana is using it in a very creative way and thinking about kind of like digital doubles and kind of uncanniness and sort of fake personas. And so I, I'm just curious to kind of uh, 
hear from other people, you know, how might we use some of these sort of like expensive high production value tools that are now starting to kind of become available to, to ordinary people? How might we use them in ways other than just kind of, you know, imitating the glossiness of sort of Hollywoodized podcasts? There's a, there's a another company that's very similar to Descript in Europe that that um, I'm hoping to work with, which does exactly the same thing as Descript, but also allows you to change the language. So what you can what I want to do is basically you record for like three hours your own voice, and you can do exactly what you described there. Um, so then you could feed in any text, and it comes out in my voice, as as you said. But then what you can do is go back through your entire back catalog of podcasts and create them in Spanish, French, German, what have you. <laughs> you so know, as with your to, voice, with speaking my, with, that language yeah, fluently? Speaking, speaking that language fluently, that's, the, that's wow. the aim. So again, that's the aim of kind of broadening, like getting past the barrier, obviously, of, of, of languages that we've talked about in, in, in the past. That's amazing. <laughs> I think what I want to add is, uh, I think, so I've, um, before I was obsessed with podcasts, I was obsessed with video games. So actually I wrote a bit about Skyrim and I was very critical of um, basically how these sort of triple A video game industries um, have professed a particular idea of player agency. So this idea that you can, you have to make your own choices. You could just roam the world freely. And that has become some like somewhat dominant uh, or like that has been a way to evaluate that that has become a way to evaluate uh, video games. So I was very critical of this mode because I think, well, I have some ideological issues with that because, um, yeah, I think it's a very sort of neoliberal mindset that uh, the individual must have all the agency, also very exploitative to the environment. If you as a, if the main thing that the video games is sort of aimed at doing is uh, you exploiting the environment at the best possible rate. And so. I, and I, but at the same time, there was also this critique of like, well, um, from a triple A video game perspective, uh, indie games weren't able to provide that. So they weren't real video games. And I think even though if these technologies become available, I think it's still necessary to ask like ideological questions about, well, sh should that be how we want to play video games or listen to podcasts? And I, I think so that's one sort of thing I want to raise, like, do we is it is it better to have things that are have these technologies that have things make sound make them sound like they're very well produced and that they're like perfectly smooth and that um, like even if we as sort of more uh, I guess grassroots produced podcasters use these things so actually I would like to make the argument for uh, not using these technologies and rather have like I I love crappy sounding podcasts I really do just these conversations between people where it's not very well edited, where it's just like you're listening into this conversation of two people talking. Like, I really appreciate that and I love that. And it's also so much easier to make, which I think also then allows for, allows for these interesting conversations to be heard by larger audiences. I mean, maybe that's just me as sort of an academic speaking that I, I mean, I love academic podcasts and that's all, basically only interviews with people. Um, but I, I love it when sometimes the conversation gets a little off track or, yeah, or gets on a tangent or uh, when like the audio that you sort of hear that they're like recording at a particular environment. So I, I really appreciate that as well. So I, I think, I don't know, like, should we even want to have these sort of perfectly well produced podcasts? And sometimes, um, I mean, at the same time, I really appreciate it when some some podcasters make use of it. Um, Welcome to Night Vale, for example, has this episode where they're only broadcasting it on like the one ear instead of the, uh, and basically the argument is then you have to keep your eye out for the rest of the world, which I think is like cool and innovative, but at the same time, yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I wonder, I think the beauty of podcasts is also that it's easy to produce uh, and that it's also fine that they sound shitty occasionally. Um, I hope that made sense and it wasn't too much of a tangent, but. <laughs> yeah, like, like I wonder if, if the pursuit of, of, um, production quality homogenizes podcasts in a way and you know takes I don't know what like what people like about two celebrities chatting about stuff and turns it into the podcast version of the press junket which mm -hmm. is a very sterilized way to to talk about you know the, the things that they're doing and you know that can happen for everybody where everybody chases the the same ideal and that smooths out a lot of the rough edges that maybe make podcasts unique for, for a lot of people um, or a lot of podcasts unique. Yeah, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I've, I've heard people talk um, both about 
uh, YouTube and podcasts as, you know, with the goal of trying to produce content that is pretty well polished, but then kind of intentionally leaving a little, you know, a few rough edges. Um, and I guess the idea of authenticity, it makes the consumer um, feel like, yeah, this is something I could do too. And so, you know, it, it builds a kind of sense of um, uh, a, a connection between listener and, and creator. Um, and, and that, you know, that, that's, I think, as I say, I think it's a feature in both the, the um, podcasting world and, you know, with YouTube. So on the one hand, you want, you know, people want to make it very, you know, slick and Hollywoody. Um, but at the same time, it can't look too much like it's traditional media. Yeah, it's like the, you, you, sometimes you want to throw in like some, I don't know, sometimes faux authenticity <laughs> when you're, mm -hmm. when you're making your stuff. So, so it's not quite too polished. Or yeah. Rebuff that edge a little bit. So I, um, have the responsibility of, um, calling this session to an end. It is 12 Eastern. Um, I've posted the feedback form in the chat um, uh, just in case this conversation has sparked any ideas for sort of, you know, future projects, future resources um, that you might want to work on together with other people in Humanities Podcast Network or something that, you know, other people might create. Um, but I would say, you know, let's continue this back in the gather space um, and hope to see you either there or at other sessions later today. And definitely thank you to all of the leaders of this session. Thanks all. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>